the carbon dioxide coming into the solution and then we add the calcium and you can see it is creating calcium carbonate solid from the gas and calcium we are getting from the waste from the industry. So all the things we are creating waste from wells with a very sustainable solution it can be scalable to gigatons, million tons. So it is going to solve the problem not over here. Please. It's slightly better. So, sir, this is the IIT Bombay nano fabrication facility. We work on semiconductor technologies for India's digital transformation, energy, agriculture. So, we have a few things here. I'll start from this side. So, these are semiconductor chips co developed between IIT Bombay and our national silicon fabrication unit in. And uh, these are memory and encryption chips so that as their digital transformation is also safe and secure. Uh, and then on this side, we have devices that are for communication, satellite communication, that are for remote sensing. And this is uh, now getting uh, transferred to our base agency that started. Uh, here I have uh, sensors, gas sensors for environmental sensing and for safety of uh, battery systems. So this is for our safety transformation. And the last one, this exhibit is actually uh, traveling, so I'm not able to show you, but it already appears on uh, UN documents. It's a soil moisture sensor uh, for sensing moisture nutrients in soil developing. Thank you very much for visiting us. Thank you. Let me have a picture with you. Yes, sir. Front, please. Yeah, yeah. Sir, all of them, please. Why, why, please? Please. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India, the United Nations, 
the Observer Research Foundation, and the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay, I extend a very warm welcome to all of you here. We have gathered here for the UN Day Public Lecture by our Chief Guest, United Nations Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres. The title of the talk today is India at 75, India-UN Partnership, Strengthening South-South Cooperation. May I now invite the Deputy Director of IIT Bombay, Professor S. Sudarshan, to kindly deliver the welcome address. On behalf of the Director of IIT Bombay, Professor Subhashish Chaudhary, myself, and all the other people from IIT who are here today, I'm very happy to welcome uh, UN Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres, uh, our ambassador uh, to the uh, UN uh, permanent representative, uh, Ambassador Ruchira Kamboj, and uh, Mr. Uh, Samir Saran, who is president of the Observer Research Foundation. Uh, and their entire teams who are here today, sitting out here. The Indian Institute of Technology was set up uh, about 64 years back, in 1958, by the government of India, with the support of UNESCO. And also at that time, with the support of the USSR. Now, at that time, it was a really small place, started with a few students. But with all the support that the Indian government gave, but also very importantly, that the UN helped uh, us to go from uh, you know, a small university which was just starting, but we were able to you know, improve the quality of the offerings, our teaching and research, to a point where today, IIT Bombay is one of the leading technology institutes in the world, not just in India. Now, as a, uh, I, to give you an idea of how big it is, we are now 13,000 students, which ranks amongst the biggest uh, group in the world. And it's fully residential. Almost all our students are here on campus. We have a combination of undergraduate. Those in India know that IIT is known for its undergrad education. But it's important to note that we actually have more graduate students and PhD students put together than undergrads today. So there's a very strong emphasis on research. Of course, our education part is still going very strong. We continue to offer the best education, which is reflected in the popularity of our undergrad courses as well as our grad courses. Now, the product of our education part of what we do, our alumni have done extremely well. They have been uh, entrepreneurs who have started a large number of companies. Uh, you would know of Ola, for example, many others. Uh, they are the CEOs of top global companies, for example, uh, Federal Express uh, right now, amongst others in the past. Uh, they have been uh, leaders in uh, other uh, areas, including research and academics. But I would like to point out two people in particular today, because one of them, uh, Mr. Ashish Chauhan, who is here today, has been the CEO of both the Bombay Stock Exchange before and now the National Stock Exchange. The National Stock Exchange is one of the biggest in the world. It has the uh, largest number of contracts uh, traded, I believe, in the world. And so we are proud that our alumnus is heading it. We are also very proud that Dr. Rajendra Shende, who was working with the UN for over 20 years, and he was a co-author of the IPCC report. And IPCC, as you know, won the Nobel Prize a few years back. Um, so we are very happy that IIT Bombay has contributed in these ways too. Now coming to our faculty, we have about 700 faculty, and they work in all areas of technology, all the engineering branches, all the sciences, including social science, economics, policy, and many other areas. And across all these areas, they are regarded as amongst the best in the world. They have won all kinds of international recognition, whether it is uh, citations, fellowships, whatever it is. Uh, we are uh, amongst the best universities in the world. And as I said, uh, research uh, has a particular emphasis today. And we carry out research in many areas. But today, particularly, I want to point out that we are doing a lot of research in the area of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which are very important for not only us, but for the younger generation who is sitting here today and future generations, so that we leave behind a world which is better than the world we came into hopefully, if we do it right. 
And so IIT Bombay is helping towards those goals. Uh, so amongst the things we are doing, we have a top-notch program in climate studies. We have a number of people working on photovoltaics, on uh, battery technology, which are all important for uh, weaning us off from fossil fuels. Uh, we also have a center on carbon capture, which will hopefully help to reduce the carbon dioxide already in the atmosphere. We also have a strong policy group, and this is very important because policy helps drive it. For example, uh, Dr. Shende, who I mentioned, uh, he, he helped create the UN policy uh, on ozone layer, which has had a tremendous success. So that's also something we want to solve the problem. We are not just doing narrow academic research, but we want to solve problems in the real world. Uh, we are also working on affordable healthcare, including AI and digital technologies. We have very strong groups on that. We also have a number of people working on technologies for rural areas. So with all these efforts, we want to create a better future for our citizens, particularly those at the bottom of the pyramid. That's something we don't want to lose sight of. We are not just working for those at the top, but for those at the bottom. So we're very happy that uh, the UN Secretary General is here today, and he can see some of the effects that uh, what UN started uh, 64 years back have achieved today. Uh, he saw the exhibits outside, and I hope uh, he found them interesting. And it also gives us great pleasure to note that uh, uh, Secretary General Mr. Guterres is himself in an earlier avatar, not today, an electrical engineer from the Technical University of Lisbon. Um, of course, that was long back, so for the students who are sitting here waiting to ask him questions, please go easy on the electrical engineering questions. <laughs> uh, so, sir, it's a real pleasure to have you visit a technological institution again after perhaps many years. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Professor Sudarshan. I now invite the United Nations Resident Coordinator in India, Mr. Shombi Sharp, to deliver his address. Excellency, Secretary General of the United Nations and uh, members of the uh, UN delegation, um, Excellency Ambassador uh, Cambodge and uh, members of the uh, delegation of Ministry of External Affairs, uh, President of ORF, our dear friend, Samir Saran, and uh, Deputy Director of IIT uh, Bombay, um, representatives of Maharashtra Mumbai governments, and most of all, dear students, dear youth, Namaskar, Aj Tumhala Betun Kup Ananzala. Mujhe IIT Bombay me akraba hat khushi hui. Uh, especially, especially as the uh, Deputy Director reminded us that the United Nations system, uh, UNESCO, and the precursor to UN Development Program played a part in, in helping establish this uh, August institution. So uh, on behalf of the United Nations uh, system here in India, it's a great honor to be celebrating with all of you this um, confluence of multiple celebrations. Uh, India's 75th year of independence, Azadika Amrit Mahotsav, the India-UN partnership, and the upcoming United Nations Day, formally marked on Monday, but uh, I believe we are celebrating in an excellent way here today. And again, all in the context of welcoming our chief guest, uh, Secretary General, uh, to, to India. Wanted just very briefly to thank uh, ORF and Ministry of uh, External Affairs and IIT Bombay for this fantastic uh, arrangement. I know the uh, SG was impressed by all of the exhibitions. I will be very brief and my message is very simple. That in this turbulent world, as the Secretary General has powerfully argued in our common agenda, we need multilateralism with the UN at the heart more than ever before. And in the nearly one year that I've had the pleasure and opportunity to tour around this incredible country across so many different states, it's incredibly clear to me from the villages to the center, that the world needs India more than ever before. The world's largest democracy, <laughs> greatest contributor to peacekeeping since the beginning, uh, pharmacy to the world, a rising climate champion with ambitious Panchamrit uh, commitments and the Life Initiative, the largest youth generation in history 
and an immense demographic dividend to harness in the coming decades this incredible potential of you, the young people in the audience, and the rest of us, Vojo Dilse Young Hay. A leading national public digital tech stack, a dynamic private sector and research sector, as we're seeing here, pushing forward uh, renewable solutions, solar, electric vehicles, mobility, green hydrogen, and on and on and on. And we've estimated that India is alone home to 25, upwards of 50% of some of the global targets for the sustainable development goals. So as you move forward, and as India increasingly shares development best practice through the international uh, platforms, uh, G20 coming up uh, leadership, through South-South cooperation, the world also will move forward. So just to say that we, uh, to conclude, we and the United Nations system here, all of our agencies are committed partners to working with all of you to ensure that this growth story leaves no one behind, that India avails itself of its full potential, women, girls, vulnerable populations, for the SDGs. And we are very pleased to be finalizing our new offer uh, of partnership to India the UN Sustainable Development Cooperation uh, Framework 2023 to 2027, which we hope to sign next month. So looking forward to a bright road ahead, a deep partnership, and let me conclude by wishing all of you a very happy United Nations Day. Ab sabko UN Day ki hardik shub kamnahe. Thank you very much. And again, welcome to the Secretary General. Thank you, Mr. Sharp. I now request President of the Observer Research Foundation, Dr. Samir Saran, to introduce our Chief Guest, UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres. Thank you. Thank you, Falguni. And since uh, Shambi spoke in Hindi, I'll speak in English. Uh, it's my distinct honor and privilege to introduce our Chief Guest this morning. It's also a very daunting task for two reasons. He needs no introduction. And I'm speaking in front of a very young audience who are going to be fact-checking me on Wikipedia and Google all the time. <laughs> so I am going to stay away from facts as I introduce him. But before that, let me uh, uh, welcome uh, the Sec Secretary General, Ambassador Kamboj, and all the visiting dignitaries to this beautiful campus in Bombay. And we are all delighted that you've chosen us uh, as the venue where you will speak to us on this very important occasion of the impending UN Day as well as India at 75. Uh, two institutions that the world needs more of if we have to respond to some of the challenges ahead. Let me try and introduce our chief guest. What does he stand for? And over a long arc of political career from where he led his country to now where he leads the world, he has stood for delivering dignity. Dignity to those who are underserved, unprotected, and sometimes invisibilized. He has a gender-first agenda, and he has a planet-first objective. And he has reduced the average age of the United Nations headquarters. There are more young people enthused and engaged on UN-led activities, courtesy the Secretary General. His fan club. People who stand on him are huge. Only the young people will understand what I said. He has a whole, whole uh, cadre and generation of followers who swear by him because he has been able to relate to them and bring them to the plane on key issues the world needs to respond to. Why are we lucky to have him? In the last few years, we've had the pandemic that has literally affected all of us. Economies have been devastated, people died, countries in many ways were enfeebled, and multilateralism and globalization were the victims. I want to quote you, sir. In 2017 at the Raisina Dialogue, you made an impassioned appeal for multilateralism. And you said this has to be realized through integrated approaches, greater collaboration, and building on common values. 
You said this in 2017. Today, more than ever, we need to recommit ourselves to exactly this mission. The Secretary General is known to be one of the finest crisis managers. From his work in his own country to his uh, job during the time when he was helping refugees and displaced people, and to, of course, navigate, helping us navigate the world as we uh, sought to get past the past two, two and a half years. We are very lucky to have someone who understands silent diplomacy. In a world of headlines and tweets and posts, silence can be golden. And sometimes what happens behind the scenes can be far more effective for the world that emerges. Thank you, Secretary General, for being here. Finally, uh, as we turn 75, Secretary General, we at ORF and, of course, at the NEA and many other institutions, as you heard from the director of IIT, are committed to do more with the UN. This year, my friend Shombi Sharp, uh, we hosted an India Day at the UN, and the language was English. Um, but uh, we created a series of events that brought India's own journeys, successes, failures, experiences, solutions, technologies, and innovations for others to partake in. And increasingly in the days ahead, we will bring the world to those stages as well so that India can learn with them as well. The journey is of companionship. The destination is common. And you, sir, are the beacon for multilateralism. I'm delighted to welcome you to deliver the address today to all of us. Professor Shaudhuri, dear friends, all protocol observed, I am delighted to be here with all of you. Uh, this institution is 54 years old, and uh, as it was said, 54 years ago, I was a student of the university in Lisbon, and uh, my school was called, I will say it in Portuguese, but you will understand, Instituto Superior Técnico. And uh, my dream at the time was to be a researcher in physics. Now, we don't control our destiny. Uh, we lived in a dictatorship that was at the same time an oppressive colonialist regime. We had, fortunately, a revolution. That revolution led to the liberation of the former colonies and to democracy in Portugal. And at that time, as a student, I was a volunteer working in the slums of Lisbon in different uh, areas related to health, education, and I felt a compulsion to get involved directly into politics. And so, I never became a researcher in physics. And I am envious, envious of all those that will be able to contribute to the well-being of humankind through the scientific work that is as necessary as the political work to make sure that we can live in a better world. And I'm very pleased to start this visit to India because I have a double love affair with India. First, uh, because of India's culture, history, uh, uh, India's people and its contribution uh, to today's uh, world and to the world civilization. And the second reason, because my wife was born in Goa. <laughs> so with this double love affair, I'm delighted to be here with all of you. And it is indeed a pleasure to be in the Indian Institute of Technology, Mumbai, to talk about the partnership between India and the United Nations and strengthening South-South cooperation. And I'm also delighted to celebrate with you the 75th anniversary of India's independence, Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav. I congratulate India on its achievements over the last 75 years as the world's largest democracy and now as the fastest growing major economy. As an engineering graduate with a lifelong commitment to education, I feel, as I said, very much at home at ITT Mumbai. The Institute's global mission and long history of transformative education make this the ideal place to talk about the strong partnership 
between India and the United States. India was a founding member of the United Nations. The drafters of the UN Charter took great inspiration from Gandhiji's message of peace, nonviolence, and tolerance. And thanks to an Indian woman, Hansa Mehta, Article 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights recognizes the equality of women and men. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Human beings. Some people thought it should be all men, linked to the old traditions of the past. Now, as a founding member of the Non-Allied Movement and the Group of 77, India has always been a leading advocate for the concerns of aspir and aspirations of developing countries. India is also the biggest provider of military and police personnel to UN missions, including the first all-women UN police contingent to a peacekeeping mission. Over 200,000 Indian men and women have served in 49 peacekeeping missions since 1948, a remarkable contribution to peace in the world. As a member of the Security Council, for the past two years, India has contributed significantly to promoting multilateral solutions and to address crises, and welcome India's initiative on greater accountability for those who target peacekeepers. So, dear students, dear members of the faculty, our world today faces mounting global challenges. Countries still reeling from the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic are being battered by energy, food, and cost of living crises accelerated by the war in Ukraine. Old and new conflicts have displaced more than 100 million people all around the world. The devastating impact of climate disruption is more apparent by the months. You have felt this across India, from heat waves in the grain-growing heartlands to flooding in the northeast and coastal states. Halfway to the finish line, some of the most fundamental sustainable development goals have gone into reverse, moving backwards instead of moving ahead. More people today are hungry, more people are living in poverty than a few years ago. And today I'd like to focus on India's unique opportunity to shape the global agenda as a principal player and a model for others. As the home of one-sixth of humanity and the world's largest generation of young people, Indian, India can make or break the 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals. India's success in translating the Sustainable Development Goals into action will mean the difference between success and failure for up to half of the global Sustainable Development Goal targets for more than any other country. India's recent development journey is characterized by high-impact programs delivered at scale. This includes the world's largest food-based social protection scheme and the massive expansion of access to clean water and sanitation services. India's whole-of-society approach to development combines old-fashioned community outreach with cutting-edge technology. Many of your most successful programs are driven by world-class public digital infrastructure, which aligns more than 1 billion mobile internet users with financial inclusion initiatives online, namely health services and more. Indian women have played a central role in many of these initiatives, from health workers at community clinics to scientific research and technology. And today, the number of Indian women and men taking STEM degrees are nearly at parity. India's digital health platform, COWIN, hosted the world's largest vaccination program for COVID-19, delivering more than 2 billion doses. And the United Nations has accompanied India in all these development milestones, from the World Food Program support for India's public distribution system to the UN Development Programs Partnership with the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. India also demonstrates a practical and generous approach to global solidarity and South-South cooperation. It was the first country 
to launch a single country South-South Cooperation Support Framework via the UN-India Development Framework Partnership. And indeed, our relationship with India on development is a two-way partnership. From your donations of medicines, equipment and vaccines at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, to your humanitarian assistance and development finance, Afghanistan and Sri Lanka, your increasing impact on the international stage, India is today a partner of choice of the United Nations. And India's upcoming presidency of the G20 will be an important opportunity to bring the values and vision of the developing world to the top table of the global economy. There is an interesting coincidence we have the presidency of Indonesia, followed the presidency of India, followed by the presidency of Brazil, and followed by the presidency of South Africa. Which means that uh, for the first time in history, four, four crucial developing countries will lead the G20. And it is an opportunity that cannot be missed to make our international economic and financial relations that are extremely unfair, there is an opportunity we cannot miss to deeply reform institutions, procedures, regulations, and norms to make sure that we have a world economy for all and not only a world economy for the rich. Now, I welcome your declared aim of sharpening the G20 approach to the 2030 Agenda. These successive G20 three, four, yeah, four successive G20 presidencies by developing countries could be used to create a space for comprehensive strategies to address current global crises. And I count on India's support in mobilizing G20 countries around debt relief. Many developing countries are at or near debt distress and require multilateral action, including the expansion and the extension of the G20 Debt Service Suspension Initiative. We live in a dramatic situation for developing countries. When the COVID-19 emerged, there was a huge inequality in the world in relation to vaccines. But as important as the inequality in relation to vaccines, was the inequality in relation to the resources available for recovery. $16 trillion in the world were mobilized for recovery through direct financing by states to guarantees and to other financial mechanisms. The United States and Europe have printed money. Now, of course, Printing money is done in a very sophisticated way through interventions of the central banks, through different kinds of uh, um, uh, buying bonds, but it is like in the past, printing money. But most developing countries could not print money because if they would print money, their currencies would go down the drain. And so the truth is that the recovery from the pandemic was largely concentrated from the financial point of view in the developed countries. Developing countries have received very little from the financial instruments of recovery. And the result, because of the dramatic impact in their societies and the need to support their people, was a dramatic increase in debt. And we have today a large number of countries that are on the verge of collapse. And we do not have any effective instrument of debt relief in today's world especially for middle-income countries that were dramatically impacted. Imagine a small island development, development country, like uh, uh, countries in the Caribbean or in the Pacific or even in the Indian Ocean. That small island has 40% of GDP with tourism. For two years, there were no tourists. That small island had to import fuel, food, and now the prices of food and fuel are skyrocketing. So that small island accumulated debt. But it is considered a middle-income country, so it has no access to any debt relief instrument and no access for concessional funding from international financial institutions. That is why I've said several times the international financial system is morally bankrupt. 
It was devised by the rich to serve the interests of the rich. This is the moment to change it. And that is why I encourage India's engagement in deep reform of the global financial architecture, which, as I said, favors those that conceived it and is terrible detrimental to the interests of developing countries, especially the least developed countries. Now, the climate crisis could be the greatest barrier to our collective development aspirations, and India is no exception. It is already a grave threat to India's economy, agriculture, and food sector, and to the health, lives, and livelihoods of hundreds of millions of people. Record-breaking heat waves, droughts, and floods in parts of India are causing havoc already. These are a foretaste of what it is to come without much greater global climate action. Climate devastation is a reality at 1.2 degrees of warming. Now, current global commitments put us on track to more than double this level. And let's not forget, G20 countries are responsible for 80% of global emissions, and they must take the lead in cutting greenhouse gases. Now, it's important to fully recognize the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capacities in light of national circumstances. This is the sentence that resulted in a compromise in the Paris Agreement to take into account that the effort that is required to developed countries must be bigger than the effort that is required to developing countries, even if all must contribute to our objective. Now, while fully recognizing this principle, the truth is that I've also asked the emerging economies to take an extra step to close the so-called mitigation gap. But uh, they can only do this with the financial and technical support of developed countries. This is the moment in which we will be defeated by climate change forever, if there is not an historical pact between developed countries and the emerging economies. Of course, small island developing states do not contribute much to uh, climate change. Most African continents do not contribute much to climate change. But today, thanks to the development of countries like India or China or Indonesia, there is a contribution also from emerging economies. But it is clear those emerging economies cannot go as fast as developed countries because of their industrial structure, their agricultural structure, and because in the past they have contributed much less to climate change. So we need an historical pact in which developed countries strongly support with financial and technical resources emerging economies to allow for combined efforts of the two with extra requirements from developed countries uh, uh, to, be, uh, to allow us to defeat climate change and to keep the temperature under control, if possible, and I would say it is necessary at 1.5 degrees. Now, this is why I have called for coalitions of support around countries. I did it in the Glasgow uh, COP. Namely, India, with ambitious planes plans to accelerate the deployment of renewables. And I therefore welcome the establishment of the so-called Just Energy Transition Partnerships. Such partnerships can help emerging economies to accelerate the deployment of renewables through a closely coordinated process that is nationally owned. And above all, a Just Energy Transition will benefit millions of Indians and other peoples who suffer the triple impact of pollution energy poverty, and the climate crisis. And I welcome India's leadership in converting domestic climate action into international collaboration through the International Solar Alliance and International Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. The United Nations and I have a very clear perspective. We need a renewables revolution but that renewables revolution will only be possible with effective solidarity of the developed world with developing countries that are also needed in this revolution, also to the benefit of their own populations. And critical renewable technologies, such as battery storage, should be treated as global public 
goods. I had the opportunity to see a very interesting development just a few uh, minutes ago. So we need to diversify supply chains and manufacturing capacity, and we must reduce the cost of capital for renewable energy investments in the developing world. One of the problems we have today is that uh, it's much cheaper to produce electricity with solar or wind than with coal or gas. But the cost of electricity produced by solar or wind is essentially the investment cost. And the cost of electricity produced by gas or coal is the running cost of burning those fuels. And today we have a dramatic situation. Already 20 countries are paying interest rates 10 points above the American Treasury bills. So the only way to allow for a renewables revolution in the developing countries is reducing the cost of capital in developing countries. And for that, there must be a concerted effort, namely making the multilateral development institutions, the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the IMF, understand that beyond the loans that they can provide, they need to be able to leverage through guarantees, through first risk takers, to leverage massive doses of private finance to allow to reduce the cost of capital in developing world for the developing world to be able to do the just transition that is necessary for their economies. And I urge India to become a global superpower in renewables technology and a manufacturing hub to fuel this revolution around the world. And I've seen through the examples that were shown to me that you will have the capacity to do so. And I look forward to work with Prime Minister Modi and the Indian government to drive this agenda forward. And I will continue to urge developed countries who bear a historic responsibility to provide the necessary finance in adequate conditions to the developing world. The Lifestyle for Environment initiative that uh, the Prime Minister Modi will launch, and uh, I will be there tomorrow, seeks to create a self-reliant model that transforms consumption habits for the benefit of all in India and around the world. And I can see here today that India's research and innovation ecosystem is strong and vibrant. And if I may be allowed to address the students in this hall, I urge you to use your considerable talents to tackle the planetary emergency we face, to develop renewable technology, to find new solutions to pollution and to biodiversity loss. And naturally, I respectfully urge you not to work for those who are wrecking our climate. I've been saying that to university students all over the world. <laughs> Don't look only at the salary of your future work. Look at the contribution of the companies or entities for which you work to have a better world, a more sustainable and inclusive world. And you'll feel much happier afterwards. There is unfortunately a number of people in the world that still have only one objective, one day to be the richest person in the cemetery. That doesn't bring <laughs> happiness. Now, COP27 in Cairo will demand strong leadership from India as we accelerate implementation of the Paris Agreement. And I count on India to participate at the highest level and to deliver a balanced outcome that recognizes the importance of adaptation, mitigation, and finance. We also need to make serious progress on loss and damage in Cairo. Loss and damage will be crucial to reestablish trust between developing countries and developed countries. And loss and damage is, first of all, the recognition that it exists, and second, the assumption of responsibilities to be able to address the needs that it generates. And that is why adaptation is so important and funding to adaptation is so important. If you have a flood and you have a road at the level of the ground, the road will disappear. If you have a road system that is higher, the road will not disappear. If you have mangroves all around your coastal areas that are more vulnerable, the coastal areas will resist. If the mangroves have been wiped out, the coastal areas will not resist. And all that requires huge investment. And that investment needs to be financed through international cooperation. And the recognition of loss and damage might be a very important instrument to do so. 
As climate impacts grow, we must scale up financing for loss and damage to support the world's most vulnerable people, communities and nations. And on this global challenge, all countries have to move together. We need an honest conversation about rights and responsibilities. And it is clear that countries that had no part in creating this crisis cannot continue to pay the highest price for it. Dear friends, India has been a global leader from the moment of its birth. Your non-violent independence movement encouraged anti-colonial struggles around the world. Your victory was a catalyst that helped to end the long epoch of in European imperialism everywhere. As an elected member of the Human Rights Council, India has a responsibility to shape global human rights and to protect and promote the rights of all individuals, including members of minority communities. India's voice on the global stage can only gain in authority and credibility from a strong commitment to inclusive and respect from human rights also at home. And the Indian model of plurality is based on a simple but profound understanding. Diversity is a richness that makes your country stronger. The understanding is the birthright of every uh, Indian, but it is not a guarantee. It must be nurtured, strengthened, and renewed every day in this and in every other society. By practicing the values of Gandhi, by security and upholding the rights and dignity of all people, especially the most vulnerable, by taking concrete action for inclusion, recognizing the enormous value and contributions of multicultural, multi-religious and multi-ethnic societies, by condemning hate speech unequivocally, by protecting the rights and freedoms of journalists, human rights activists, students and academics, and by ensuring the continued independence of India's judiciary, this is the India that the world has celebrated, and I urge Indians to be vigilant and to increase your investments in an inclusive, pluralistic, diverse community and society. In Indias across the world, much more needs to be done to advance gender equality and women's rights. And this is a moral imperative and a multiplier for prosperity and sustainability. No society can reach its full potential without equal rights and freedoms for women, men, girls and boys. Dear friends, India is at a decisive moment. You have an unprecedented opportunity to speak up for the global south and to lead by example as a model of resilience and an advocate for sustainable development, global financial reform and climate justice. And the decisions that you make today and the path you chart over the next 18 months could have a global resonance for decades to come. I urge India to continue speaking up for peace, to expand its global leadership, to align its development and its foreign policy, the SDGs and the Paris Agreement, to find innovative solutions to today's global crisis. As your first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru said at the dawn of independence 75 years ago, and I quote, our dreams are for India, but they are also for the world. For all the nations and peoples are too closely knit together today for any one of them to imagine that it can live apart. Across the United Nations system, at the global level, through the UN Resident Coordinator and the UN Country Team of Agency funds and programs, we are proud to be your committed partners. Let's work together for the next 75 years to create a more peaceful, just, sustainable and inclusive world for all and I trust India will give a fundamental contribution for that to be possible. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that very powerful address, uh, Secretary General. And I guess. Uh, what we're going to really do today is turn it over to you guys, uh, the young minds, the students, to speak to the Secretary General. And uh, we're going to try and get as many questions as possible. But before that, Mr. Uh, Mr. Secretary General, I wanted to, uh, I, I just uh, got a glimpse of your statement at uh, uh, the memorial for the Mumbai terror attacks. You were there, you made a very powerful statement. And in fact, you also alluded to us having to do much more. Fundamental question to you. Why is it that the world is incapable of responding to terror? 
why is it that terrorism has become a weapon of choice for certain actors? And why is it that culprits are still roaming free? Why can't we agree on terrorism? And you've been working on this for over 10 years now. Personally, you've been invested in this issue. Why can't we agree? First of all, there is not enough cooperation in fighting terrorism as such. Uh, terrorism became a global issue. You have terrorists that move from uh, uh, Afghanistan to Syria, from Syria to Libya, from Libya to the Sahel, back to uh, Yemen, and from Yemen again to Afghanistan. Um, uh, Today, terrorist networks use sophisticated technologies. Terrorist networks um, uh, use the, um, the deep internet and uh, the, I mean, a number of instruments that are deep to, to detect. Uh, and the international cooperation to fight terrorism is far from being sufficiently organized to be effective in fighting terrorist organizations. That, that became a global affair. Terrorism is no longer a local issue in which people do things because of, uh, I mean, wrong ideas they have at local level. Terrorism became a global phenomenon and our instruments to address terrorism, to fight terrorism, are not effectively coordinated at global level. Second, Geopolitical divisions also contribute to the difficulties in addressing terrorism in an effective way. And third, there is not enough work in the prevention of terrorism, in building resilience of communities against terrorist ideas. We see how terrorism proliferates and the, the dramatic inequalities that exist in the world and other forms of injustice lead some people that uh, is weaker, I would say, in their capacity to understand things in a proper way, lead some people to extremist conceptions, to extremist ideas, and we are not doing enough in the prevention of the expansion of violent extremism in the world. So there is a long way to, to go, and terrorism has not received the priority it should. That is the reason, and I said it this morning, that my first reform was to create an office of counterterrorism in the United Nations. Terrorism was dealt by a small team in the Department of Political Affairs, practically doing nothing, and today we have a solid, um, uh, a solid department that is providing technical support to countries around the world, and that is enhancing international cooperation that is absolutely vital. So we really need to understand that terrorism today is a global phenomenon, and that we all need to cooperate effectively in intelligence, in uh, uh, counterterrorism action, but also in the prevention of violent extremism to be able to defeat it. Ambassador Kambot, if I may turn to you. Uh, the Secretary General laid out an agenda for India UN over the next 75 years. How do you see this new dynamic? India at 75 and India's engagement with the UN looking ahead. Well, thank you very much, Samir. And needless to say, I'm very pleased to be here and uh, honored to share the stage with the Secretary General. Um, I'd like to make three points here. First and foremost, um, I think we all agree that India has a very deep and abiding commitment to multilateralism. Now, some of the speakers ahead of me have already said so. India was one of the founding members of the United Nations. India is among the top 25 uh, financial contributors to the United Nations. And uh, we'd like to believe, and we've proved it again and again, that we are a voice of reason, we are a bridge builder, and above all, we speak for the developing South. Um, the second thing that I would like to make, a uh, point I'd like to make here is that this is not just empty rhetoric. We literally walk the talk. Let me give you two very recent examples. Uh, during the course of the COVID pandemic, I think all of you know by now, but it bears reiteration yet again, that India supplied 240 million doses of COVID vaccines to over 100 countries across the globe. I think, personally, I felt very proud as an Indian diplomat. I think that is one of the most powerful statements in as far as vaccine equity and vaccine support is concerned. Incidentally, Secretary General, as you recall, uh, two lakh doses were also supplied to United Nations peacekeepers. 
uh, on to more present times, turning to the food crisis that is currently facing the world, India has proved again and again that it can respond to all sorts of humanitarian crises, be it in Ukraine, be it in Afghanistan, Sudan, Myanmar, Yemen, and closer home, Sri Lanka. So we're a country that walks the talk, and we truly, through this, have demonstrated our great uh, uh, commitment, uh, working uh, collaboratively, collaboratively with different countries across the globe. And my third point is that uh, reformed multilateralism. Now, I think you yourself said that India has been in the Security Council for the last two years, and we have made it very evident that the present global architecture, and I think the SG also made that point, does not serve the purpose anymore. In 1945, when the United Nations was founded, we all know there were 51 member states. Today, there are 193. Yet, the architecture of the United Nations is frozen in 1945. So how does that work? How does that even work? Clearly, it does not. So we have been arguing forcefully, we think, that the entire architecture of the United Nations needs to be reformed if it is to be made more effective, more democratic, of course, and more legitimate and more effective. And we are talking about a reform, not just in the permanent category of membership, but also in the non-permanent category, as also a reform in the working methods of the Security Council, so as to make these more democratic and thereby more effective also. So I think if you look at all of this, India as a country from 1945, when we were one of the founding members of the United Nations, to today, when we are in the Security Council for the eighth time, we are very committed multilateralists. We do believe and we do recognize that the United Nations has its constraints. Certainly, every system has its constraints. Yet the UN has delivered a lot. And as the SG has already mentioned, I think uh, the most evident manifestation on the ground is, of course, the presence of UN peacekeepers. And India is, of course, a very proud contributor to UN peacekeep uh, peacekeeping operations across the globe. We have also participated in various development activities on the ground in the United Nations. We have uh, participated in humanitarian relief operations, as I have mentioned. So we are very, very committed uh, multilateralists. And we do believe, despite all the uh, constraints of the United Nations system, that it provides a very vital space, a very vital space for countries to discuss, to debate, and to collaborate. And uh, with this mindset, I think we contribute and participate in the United Nations today. I'm very proud to represent India at the United Nations. And uh, it is always for the greater global good that India will work for at the UN. Thank you, ma'am. Back to you. Great. So let me now turn to you. Uh, let me first invite, uh, and I'm picking up names in random. There were 300 students who wanted to ask questions, Secretary General. I'm just picking up, so my apologies to but those I, I, If I may interrupt, don't uh, limit yourselves to ask questions. Uh, also push back. Give your opinions. Yeah, and uh, if you, there are uh, criticism that you believe is necessary to express, don't shy away. I mean, uh, we all live in a democratic society, so please take full profit so I can confirm that's for you Indians don't shy away. <laughs> okay, believe this is your dining table in your house and speak like that. So let me first invite Ishita Mishra, student Don Bosco International School. Is she here? Can I have a mic to her? Where is Ishita? Oh, there you are. Go ahead. Okay, um, first of all, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to ask this question. Um, as we build and promote South South cooperation, how is the United Nations working with its member states towards achieving gender equality, women's empowerment, and ending violence against women and children with respect to building a more equitable world? So, sorry, I didn't understand. I'm a, a bit deaf and I. Uh, uh, so you, you ask what the United Nations is doing in relation to inequality? Gender equality. Gender women's equality. Ah, gender equality. This is a... Uh, and, and violence against women. That's also... Shared. Yes, 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 yes. This is a very dear issue for me. Um, uh, I must confess that uh, uh, there is one problem I did not manage to solve. Uh, many people thought, and I fully respect that, that the Secretary General of the United Nations should be a woman. And that problem I cannot solve for the moment. <laughs> but uh, uh, one thing uh, is for me clear. The question of gender equality is essentially a question of power. 
We live in a male-dominated world with a male-dominated culture everywhere in the world with different situations depending on tradition, on culture, on many aspects, but this is a general trend. Um, and, uh, and so the question is a question of power. Now, to attack the question of power, the first thing we did was to achieve gender parity at the management level of the UN. And we did it two years before the target. The target would be 2021. We did it in uh, because it uh, varies a little bit. Even if we have two men here of that group and no woman today in this delegation, I'm terribly sorry for that. But um, that's how it is. Uh, uh, but uh, of this 190 something, more than half are women in top management positions. And not only in, I would say, uh, peripheric things. The head of the Department of Political Affairs is a woman. Uh, just to give an example. The head of our mission in Afghanistan or in Iraq are women. Uh, the previous head of our mission in uh, Libya was a woman. So uh, the head of our mission in the Democratic Republic of Congo is a woman. The head of our mission in the Central African Republic is a woman. And they have military peacekeeping forces under their direction. So first, gender parity at all levels, and we hope to reach it at 2028, but at the top level. And this is something we need to ask at, in all dimensions of societies, in governments, in parliaments, in the boards of companies, we need gender parity to make sure that decisions are taken at the top level in a way that then brings gender equality as a natural downstream uh, 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 phenomenon. On the other hand, we need to support all women's organization and all bottom-up approaches to gender equality, and we have, through UN Women, through other areas of the UN activity, a strong support to the civil society around the world in relation to gender equality. And yes. violence against women. I launched an appeal. This is a matter not only of importance, it's an emergency matter, because things are getting worse, not better. So I launched an appeal, and uh, a meaningful number of countries, I cannot give you the exact number today, have responded positively. Every country should have an emergency plan to fight violence against women, covering all aspects. Training of police, training of the judiciary, um, uh, investing in uh, uh, the areas where violence of women against women is more predominant. Uh, uh, namely in social investment in those areas, uh, making sure that uh, there is clear accountability in society in relation to violence against women. I had that experience as Prime Minister of Portugal. There was reluctance in discussing it. Uh, family violence was something that was not in the agenda. And one of the biggest battles I had was to make sure that we put family violence, which was essentially violence against women, in the center of our internal debate, and that in the police training, in the reforms of the judiciary, in all other aspects of the administration, this would be a priority in the way we do business. And I think the same must happen everywhere. The society hides violence against women. The society conspires mm -hmm. to make sure that violence against women is not shown as it is. So there is need also for active capacity to denounce it wherever it happens and to create the mechanisms in which uh, those that are active fighting violence against women do not become themselves victim. And today, unfortunately, we have with social media and uh, many other aspects, terrible campaigns against women activists, against women politicians. Uh, violence against women politicians physical violence less, but uh, violence through social media is today enormous around the world and needs, needs to be assumed by everybody. And I would say particular responsibility for boys and men as an absolute priority. Gender equality is essential. We will not get it without a change in power, so gender parity is essential. But at the same time, 
the, the big cancer of violence against women needs to be an emergency priority of all those that have responsibilities in the world. Uh, can I uh, now move to uh, a college student, Devosmita Majumdar, PhD Climate Studies at IIT Bombay. Devosmita? Oh, there you are. Do you have a mic somewhere? Thank you for giving this opportunity to ask a question. So my question is, what was the hardest decision you have taken being SG, and how you dealt with it? The toughest decision as a Secretary General. What, the? what is the toughest decision toughest you have decision. taken as a Secretary General, and how did you deal with it? Let me add a small caveat, uh, uh, another addendum to it. Addendum. Are you a Secretary or are you a General? <laughs> <laughs> well. The, probably the honest answer to the two questions is I don't know. <laughs> uh, I think the, my toughest decision was to consider my uh, reappointment. <laughs> that was a good one. The Secretary General is the chief administrative officer of the United Nations. And the interpretation of some member states, it should be just that. And unfortunately, as chief administrative officer, the uh, secretary general has very little power because I cannot even create a post uh, in uh, the uh, office of the United Nations in, uh, um, uh, I mean, uh, the, our uh, uh, Economic Commission for Asia is in Bangkok. I cannot create a post without going to the General Assembly and the, and the ACABQ and the Fifth Committee. So, I mean, the level of bureaucratic uh, levels is such that there is not much power in being the Chief Administrative Officer. And apparently there is nothing else except one article that says that the Secretary General can uh, if he feels that there is a situation that uh, um, uh, threatens peace and security, can address the Security Council and draw the attention to that. But draw the attention. I mean, <laughs> it, it is not said if it is written or oral. It is not said if the Security Council needs to meet about it or not. So uh, what the Secretary General has invented in the past, and many member states uh, are, uh, uh, agree with that, is that there is something called good offices. And so, for instance, the war in Ukraine. There is no way I can end the war in Ukraine. But there was something I thought I should do, was to try to work with the Russians, with the Ukrainians, but also with the Europeans, the Americans, etc., to see if it was possible to come to agreements allowing for the export of grains from the Ukraine and allowing for um, Russian food and fertilizers also to be able to move uh, uh, freely independently of the sanctions regimes. So it's good offices. It's not a power. No. I mean, I cannot tell the Ukrainians and the Russians, you now do this, or the Americans. and the, No. But I can go and talk to them, and especially being discreet, because if I start using megaphone diplomacy, forget about it. There is no way you can get anything. But so the importance for Secretary General is to have the humility to understand that we have no power and that the only thing you can is to be faithful and loyal to the values, the UN Charter. I consider that I have the right to defend the Charter in all circumstances, and that is the reason of the many positions that I've been taken, be loyal to the Charter and do everything we can with our good offices to create conditions for dialogue, for cooperation, for people to come together and uh, sometimes uh, to uh, speak up and to say that some things are not acceptable. Can I now request Anamika Changrani Rastogi, student Dhirubhai Mbani International School, to pose a question? Um, so first of all, the mask it's not um, thank you for your speech and your insightful comments on the issue of sustainability. Um, as you said, developing nations face unique challenges when it comes to the issue of the climate crisis. What, in your opinion, is the most important thing for developing nations to focus on in the next few decades with regards to sustainability? 
Well, I would say the most important thing are two. First, to have in all levels of decision and authority, be it in governments, be it in the boards of companies, be it in civil society organizations, be it in international organizations, to have sustainability as mainstream sustainability as a basic condition in all decisions. But as important as that is our own behavior contribute to sustainability. And let's be honest, uh, I am not yet entirely convinced that the majority of the people in the world are sufficiently aware of what climate change or about uh, what uh, biodiversity loss means to change their lives. And that is why it is so important, the initiative that will be launched tomorrow about lifestyle and environment. This will not change if we, each one of us, does not change. The thing that is obvious, if you want to fight climate change, is to end subsidies to fossil fuels. But you end subsidies to gas, and um, all of a sudden, there is an upheaval. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is that the upheaval normally does not come from the poorest sectors of yes. the population. It comes from the middle class, and especially the upper middle class. Mm -hmm. So we are not yet in a situation in which the majority of the people has fully understood that climate change is the existential threat of our time. And so, I mean, we need to ask the politicians to do what they should do. We need to ask the boards of the companies to do what they should do. We need to ask the UN to do, but we need, and I have to tell you, I know it's difficult. No. Um, uh, we need to be able to also understand that we have our own footprint and that that footprint needs to uh, be sustainable. Uh, do you want to quickly add something, Ambassador Kambuch? You were nodding your head on the life part of it. Yeah, no, thank you. I was indeed, because I fully agree with what the Secretary General is saying, that eventually the change will have to come from the ground. You know, some time back, there was this movement called Green Good Deeds. Unless this becomes a mass movement, it is not going to have an impact on the climate. And that is why, uh, you know, the importance of the life initiative of the Prime Minister of India, which will be launched also by the Secretary General tomorrow in Gujarat, which is that you focus more on mindful consumption rather than mindless utilization. And then eventually, with each individual contributing his or her little bit, this will become a mass movement of pro-planet people. And this also, I think, would be a beautiful symbiotic relationship between humankind and the planet, always in harmony and you know, connected to each other. So I'll Thank quickly you. bring in one last question. I'm, I'm seeing uh, your staff about But uh, just before uh, on this, yeah. the volume of waste we produce is gigantic. Just reducing waste mm -hmm. would be a fantastic contribution each one of us can give to sustainability. Uh, can I now request um, Anurag Deshpande? Sir, we also have male students in the college. So <laughs> I, I pick up Anurag Deshpande, can you ask your question? He's, from, uh, he's doing B.Tech in mechanical engineering from IIT Bombay. Go ahead. Yeah, well, thank I'm you. I'm an engineer, but not mechanical. <laughs> yes, sir. Electric. Uh, my question is a short one. Uh, Most of the machines now work with electricity, so it's fine. <laughs> uh, my question is a short one. Out of all the sustainable development goals, uh, which do you feel is the hardest to achieve? The first, <laughs> eradication uh, of poverty. Because eradication of poverty means everything. everything. Eradication of poverty means that all <laughs> systems, that education systems work properly means that healthcare is available to everybody, means that uh, the environment is sustainable, means that uh, uh, governments are not corrupt, means, uh, and that is one of the, I mean, the 16th, uh, means that, um, I mean, uh, f food systems work properly. The most difficult is the one that is comprehensive, the one that in a certain way requires all the others to work, to also work. 
and the eradication of extreme poverty is, I mean, it is unbelievable that we live in a world where today, because of the present crisis, you have people making billions and billions and billions out of this crisis, no? namely in the fossil fuel industry, and the number of poor is increasing. And the gap between the rich and the poor is widening. And uh, it was widening among people within countries. Now, unfortunately, after the COVID, it became, again, widening in relation to countries. To fight inequality is a crucial instrument to get the eradication of poverty. And to fight inequality is, like gender equality, a question of power. That is why, if I may say something to all of you, be very good in your professions, be very good in your research, but you are also citizens. And the citizens, you have to deal with the questions of power in your society, in your country, in the companies where you work because without addressing the question of power, we will never be able to change the world. Final two minutes. One last question, sir. Final two minutes, one last question for you, sir. We all had lessons from the pandemic. We all took lessons from the pandemic when we were locked up, when we were quarantined, when we were hopeless and helpless. What is something that really bothered you in terms of global institutions? And what gave you hope? Well, what gives me hope is that um, we live in a world where we see uh, lots of manifestations of irrationality. I mean, we see the eruption of uh, forms of uh, egoist nationalism. Uh, now it's particularly sensitive in Europe in the way elections are taking place. We see uh, different forms of uh, uh, religious fundamentalism. We see... Uh, xenophobia, we see racism, we see th those things, unfortunately, uh, growing with the, the problems that the world faces. But young people today is much more cosmopolitan than in my time. Mm. In my time, uh, young people was much less able to understand that we are all connected in the same world that, uh, uh, I mean, to be Indian or to be German or to be Chinese or to be, really doesn't in the end matter because we have challenges that are global. And my generation has not been able to understand the globality of the challenges and to respond to them. But the present young generation is much more globalist than mine and much more cosmopolitan and much less narrow-minded nationalists. And so um, I, my biggest hope is that this generation will be able to correct the very serious mistakes that my generation has committed. And for those that are in the middle, uh, <laughs> I, wish you, I wish you all the best. <laughs> but I think this was a fantastic conversation. Please join me in applauding the Secretary General for his intervention. And let me turn it back to Falguni. Thank you, sir. I request our Deputy Director, Professor Sudarshan, to please present a memento to our esteemed guest today. Thank you, sir. I request. Thank you. Thank you, photographers. Please. I request the permanent representative of India to the United Nations, Ambassador Ruchira Kambosh, to kindly deliver the vote of thanks. 
Well, um, this program has come to an end, and it is my honor to deliver the vote of thanks, uh, first and foremost to the Secretary General, without a doubt. S.G., thank you so much for honoring us with your presence. And uh, I think above all, um, after all is said and done, you come across as such a wonderful human being. I think that really touches my heart above anything else. Thank you so much. A word of gratitude also to the Observer Research Foundation led by the inimitable Samir Saran. Thank you so much, Samir, for your very um, racy questions and for keeping the uh, pace very uh, energetic and fast. And uh, of course, uh, it is wonderful to be here at IIT Mumbai. I don't think any vote of thanks will be complete without saying a heartfelt thank you to IIT Mumbai. Trust me, many of us have dreamed to enter this institution and to all of you lucky kids who are studying here and all the more lucky because you got to chat with the world's top diplomat. I think you're in a brilliant place and I wish you all the very best and I'm sure you have a very bright future. I will also, uh, with your permission, SG, also thank UN India, led by the very competent Shambi Shah. Shambi, your Hindi skills are sort of, uh, you know, growing by the day, and congratulations, you're winning many, many hearts and minds in India. Well done. And uh, before I sign off, I think no vote of thanks will be complete without thanking all the people behind the scenes who make this event such a success. So my thanks to the Mumbai state government, without which none of this would have been possible. Thank you all for being with us these past few days and ensuring that the visit of the Secretary General is indeed a success. And finally, the last word to my own team, Team Ministry of External Affairs. Thank you so much. Uh, all of us who have worked together, we um, have, I think, uh, always uh, uh, going forward, we'll rely on this support. I can see the Joint Secretary UNP, who's sitting right here in front of me. A big vote of thanks to you also, Prakash and to the entire protocol team that has been backing us. Thank you very much, SG. Wonderful to see you. Thank you, Ambassador Kamboj. We will now take a group photo with the chief guest. I request everybody to please rise in your seats. Don't leave the auditorium. Just, just uh, stand up in your seats and remain standing till the delegation leaves the auditorium. We will have a group photo. Remove your mask, please, so that you can all be nicely visible in the photos, please. The photographers are requested to take turns one by one, please, to come on the dais, please. Please do not leave the auditorium. Kindly smile. <laughs> Thank you. Please, photographers, one more minute, sir. One more minute. Yes. 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 Ma'am. Can you all give a thumbs up sign yeah. together? Can we have a thumbs up sign, everybody, please? All the students, a big thumbs up. Lovely. Thank you. Please remain seated, all of you, till the delegation leaves. Kindly please take back your seats. Please take back your seats, all the students, please. Dear guests, dear guests, please, please remain seated for a few minutes. The security will guide you to the exit from this side. All students have to leave from the infinity corridor side. Please remain seated for five minutes till the security guides you.
please bear with us for five minutes more. You can start from that side, take turns, row by row, please. Students, calmly exit the auditorium. Thank you very much. Students, please leave from below, not from above. Refreshments are being served below. So please leave from below. Slowly, calmly. Do not rush. <laughs>